Hi folks, welcome back to the Tabletop's Edge. Today we have the first video in a new series called Discovering the Second World War, or TSWW. And for those of you unfamiliar with it, the Second World War is a series of strategic level games published by Diffraction Entertainment that purports to cover the entire Second World War on all fronts at the same scale and using a unified set of rules. And since it's the same scale and a single set of rules, the games are, in theory, linkable, making for a potentially huge game. Now, if you've seen any of the other videos on my channel, you know that I have a penchant for games that are big and detailed. So when TSWW first came on my radar about five to six months ago, my curiosity immediately got the better of me, and I went out and I have acquired four of the games thus far in the series. And I've been working my way through the rules, trying to come to grips with this monster of monsters. And what you're looking at here on screen is Singapore, which is the fifth or sixth game, I think, published in the series. It's published back in 2015, and uh, it actually is the game, I believe, that the current set of rules, unified set of rules, appeared in. Uh, there have been some revisions since the initial games were published, and they are going back and now are in the process of releasing second editions for the first few games in the series. But it appears that the rules have been pretty much stable since 2015, so we're looking at six, seven years and multiple releases since then. So that's a good sign, I think, for, uh, for, the, uh, for the rules and for the game system. Now, we will take a closer look at the maps, I promise, in just a few minutes. But I did want to say that with any new game that I'm learning, any kind of new system, new game, I always like to go out on YouTube and look for videos like tutorials or playthroughs and watch those because they tend to help me digest the rulebook a lot faster and really sort of flattens my learning curve uh, with, uh, with games. And I was surprised that despite TSWW being around since 2010 and having you know, like nine games released so far, that the only videos I could find were a relative handful of unboxing videos of a couple of games in the system. Now, speaking of unboxing videos, Ardwolf's Lair recently did an excellent unboxing of this game you're looking at, Singapore. So if you are interested in seeing what all comes in this rather large box, I highly recommend that you head over to uh, Ardwolf's Lair's uh, channel and check out his Singapore unboxing video. Now, that said, I mean, really the only thing I could find were unboxing videos, and it's nice to see, I mean, they're great for showing you the components that are coming in the game, but I couldn't find anything like a tutorial video or playthroughs or even like a review video that sort of discussed in fair detail how the game plays. So I am kind of taking it upon myself to maybe fill that uh, that gap and uh, put some TSWW content up there on YouTube that will allow people to see the game in action to get a hopefully a good idea of how the game works and then that will allow you to make a decision as to whether this is something you might be interested in. And if you are interested in it, is it something that you think is worth uh, spending your gaming budget dollars on? Because many of the games in this series are quite pricey. And I will talk about that here in a couple of minutes. So the goal of this series is to bring the same playthrough approach that I used with Last Blitz Krieg and World in Flames to TSWW. I will be playing through several scenarios, ranging from the very, very small scenarios up through gradually larger and larger scenarios. And um, I will be using scenarios from all of the games that I own in the series in order to give you a look at as much of the TSWW as possible. So right now, uh, that would mean scenarios from Singapore, uh, Hakapella, the uh, game on the uh, Winter War 3940 between Finland and the Soviet Union, as well as Barbarossa. And I expect Balkan uh, Fury 2, the second edition of that game, to arrive 
hopefully in the next uh, month or so. And so you may see some, uh, some, some coverage on that game as well. And we're going to start with the discovery scenarios, hence the name of this series. Those discovery scenarios are more like learning scenarios. They're very small. They tend to look at various subsystems in isolation. So for instance, land combat or naval combat, uh, air to air combat, that kind of stuff. And then we'll be moving on to gradually bigger and bigger scenarios. Now, if I eventually do ever do a campaign scenario, it's going to be from one of the smaller games like Hakapella or Balkan Fury 2. Uh, Singapore, uh, the, <laughs> the map footprint for the Singapore game is enormous, as, uh, as you'll see here in a few minutes. And even Barbarossa, while the, the map layout is not as large as it is for Singapore, the counter density is enormous in that game with almost 8,000 counters. So that would probably be a little impractical to do a playthrough of the Barbarossa campaign, but uh, I do think something like Balkan Fury 2 or Acapella uh, with a uh, smaller number of counters, smaller map area is certainly doable. So we'll have to see how that goes. If there's a good re response to the videos and you guys are enjoying this and you want to see what a full-on campaign looks like, then uh, then who knows, we, we, we probably do something like that down the road. Now, now that you have an idea of what this series will be, I'd like to share just a couple of my initial thoughts based on my limited experience with TSWW so far. And then we'll take a, uh, then we'll take a close look at those maps. Well, the first thing I want to say is that I am not an expert on TSWW. I'm learning this system, so we are going to be going through this kind of together. Uh, I have uh, been reading the rules. I have been pushing counters across the maps, but I have far less experience with this system than I do with, say, uh, Battalion Combat Series or World in Flames. So if any of you out there do have experience with this system and you see me uh, doing something incorrectly in the videos, by all means, please let me know in the comments and I will make those corrections moving forward. That said, one of the one of the concerns I have uh, with the game, and it's merely a concern, it's not necessarily a knock, it's just, again, from what I'm seeing so far, has to do with the fact that the designer refers to this as an operational game, and you heard me call it a strategic level game at the beginning of the video. And that's because the maps use a hex scale of 15 miles to the hex and two turns per month. So essentially, turns are roughly two weeks in length. Now the units, land units, are represented as battalions all the way up to divisions. An air unit is a wing of roughly 40 aircraft, and naval units represent individual ships all the way down to destroyers and even some destroyer escorts, with your smaller torpedo boats and gunboats being represented as flotillas, and submarines also being represented as flotillas. Now, to me, uh, turns that are two weeks in length, half-monthly turns, are strategic turns, not operational turns. And same thing with the 15 miles per hex. For me, and this is just a personal thing, for me, operational level means your hexes are anywhere from maybe one to say five, maybe, maybe 10 miles uh, per hex. And your turn length is going to be anywhere from one day to maybe five days. So we've got in this game, map and turn scales that I think are solidly strategic level. But yet, on the other hand, when you look at the way the units are represented with individual ships, as few as 40 aircraft per counter and battalions running around in it, those unit sizes, I think, are operational level. So one of the things I'm a little concerned about is we've got strategic level scale maps and turns, but we have operational level units and and it looks like combat and logistical mechanics. So um, is there going to be a little bit of scale confusion here? Do we have a case where it's a strategic level game that 
the designer has decided to throw everything, including the kitchen sink, into as far as getting as much detail into the game as they can, which will result in play that sort of bogs down and is slow? Or is this an operational level game whose scope is, well, bigger than might be appropriate for that level of detail. So uh, I guess what I mean by that is if you look at um, another operational level system like uh, MMP's Operational Combat Series, OCS, that's clearly an operational level game. The units are very similar in scale to what you see in TSWW, but uh, the Map hexes there, I think, are five miles or less for some of the Western games. And the turns are like half-week turns, so three to four days. But the scope of the individual games are a lot smaller than what we see here in TSWW. For instance, you have a game like Tunisia, which covers the Tunisian campaign from January to May 43 in a relatively confined geographic space. Or you get something like... Um, Smolensk, which covers a portion of Army Group Center's operations over the course of roughly two months in 1941, whereas Barbarossa in TSWW is the entire Eastern Front from June 41 to June of 43. And OCS does have its bigger games for sure. You've got Guderian Splits Creek 2, but again, that's really confined to just Army Group Center. Uh, from October 41 through May of 43. So it does, you know, OCS can get some long games in there where you're covering, you know, 18 months, year and a half or so. But it's still, even those large, large OCS games are not quite as vast in scope as TSWW. So just a concern. It may well be that my concerns are unfounded. Uh, it's really going to come down to what do I experience in gameplay. But that's just one of the things that kind of jumps out at me initially. I would have no problem calling this a, a, a really, really big operational level game if it weren't primarily for the turn scale being two weeks per turn or, or two turns per month. Um, what else? Let's see. The rule book. The rule book is generally pretty good. Uh, but it is in desperate need of a developer to come along and polish it up. The rules themselves are, uh, it's, it's well written for the most part. It's clear. I understand what each rule is trying to get across. At least I think that's the case. But there are some issues with the organization and the order of presentation. So what I mean by that is, there will be several times where I will be reading through the rules and I'll be in a rule paragraph and it will make a reference to either a rule or a procedure that hasn't been referenced yet anywhere. Now, that rule or procedure is fully explained maybe three or four paragraphs down or maybe three or four pages further on. But when you read through it initially, that that original rule paragraph doesn't make a lot of sense because you're like, well, what does that mean? You know, say such and such is resolved using whatever it may be. Well, I don't know whatever it may be means. Now, as I continue reading the rules, it does eventually become clarified for me. But now I've got to go back. And when I read that original rule paragraph again, having continued on several pages in the rules, it, it makes perfect sense and it's crystal clear. It would be nice, however, if the procedure that was referenced had been fully explained prior to that. So... Uh, that's something that I think a good uh, game developer who has a lot of experience with organizing and writing rule books would catch and help out. Also, there's some little bit of sloppy language in the rules. For example, aircraft have a range factor, uh, which for all intents and purposes act as movement points. Uh, in, in the game, but there are places in the rules where it references the aircraft's range and other places where it references that as movement points. So that sort of sloppy language can cause a little bit of confusion, particularly for players that are approaching the game for the first time. Also, the, uh, the game doesn't have the rulebook, rather, doesn't have an index, and I always like an index uh, because it makes it so much easier to look up 
uh, particular rules, specific things that you may be looking for. And this goes not just for uh, new players learning the game, but for players that are experienced with the system and are looking up something in particular, maybe something that's not used very often, you go to the index. If it's a well-done index, you'll be able to find exactly what you need in just a few seconds. That's lacking with this rule book. The table of contents is pretty decent, though. So, uh, again, I, I'm not trying to say the rule book is badly done. It really isn't. It just could stand some polishing and you know this is a problem with most small publishers and diffraction entertainment is indeed it's a small company quite frankly they're putting out an impressive product at least so far given the size of the company but um, all small publishers really seem to have some issues with their with their rule books it is definitely a, a learned skill in being able to organize and sort of edit rule books to make them as clear as possible. And that's exactly what you want. You want rule books that are going to make it as easy as possible for a new player to get into the system rather than throwing some obstacles and hurdles in the way. Uh, that said, the physical quality of the components are very good. Uh, the only issue that I might have are the counters are very, very thin, and you will see that talked about in Ardwolf's uh, unboxing of Singapore, you get an idea of just how thin they are. They actually kind of remind me of the uh, Der Weltkrieg counters. Uh, they're not, uh, Der Weltkrieg counters are a little bit thicker than these, but uh, they're similar. Uh, they are thick enough, however, that um, I do think that they're functional and um, I think they will hold up over time with, uh, with usage. And you will get to see exactly how thin these are and how easy or difficult it is for these things to be manipulated by a bunch of fat fingers here as we continue on through the, uh, through the series and you watch the, uh, the playthroughs. The maps, the maps uh, are plasticized. They've got kind of almost like a vinyl finish to them, which is, which is actually pretty nice. It's uh, said to be liquid resistant. Uh, I'm not going to test that out, however, but it is nice to know that uh, if uh, you know something happens, you might be able to wipe up that spill uh, quickly without necessarily damaging the, uh, the maps. Uh, the only other um, quibble I may have with the physical components is there doesn't appear to be enough generic informational markers included with each of the games. Now, this may be something where you could pool the markers if you end up purchasing multiple games in the series, but for the cost of these games, I would expect there to be an adequate supply of, of informational markers. Uh, just a note on the size of these games. These are big games. Um, many of them are big games. Not all of them, but many of them. Singapore is a good example of that. Uh, given the map layout size, I see the only time I would even be able to play a campaign scenario of Singapore would be at a convention like Consim World Expo in Tempe. And even then, that eight or nine plus days of gaming uh, would be totally inadequate to play through the entire campaign. It would take probably several years of playing the same campaign at that convention in order to actually get through that. Fortunately, though, there are a lot of scenarios, especially in these bigger games, that are not nearly as big as the full uh, campaign scenarios, and we are going to see many of those here in this series. So. I think you are still going to get your money's worth out of something like Singapore, even if you never attempt to play the uh, campaign scenario with, uh, with all the other scenarios in there. And some of those are large scenarios and some of them are very small. So uh, we'll take a look at uh, some of those as we go through this series. Uh, another big concern of mine is the fact that combat, whether it be land, air, or sea, requires a calculator. And there's a lot of math, and it's not necessarily simple math, involved in combat resolution. Now, the system does seem to work at the micro level, meaning individual combat resolutions. It, it uh, you know, the process, like I said, works. It gives you what I think are plausibly historical outcomes. I just wonder though, is it too cumbersome for a really big game? It's one thing if I'm having to do the naval or land combat resolution three or four times in a turn, but if I have you know, 15, 20, 25 combats that I need to resolve in a single turn, is that just going to, is this process just gonna 
bog everything down. It's not what I would consider a very clean or elegant system. It uh, it it has a bit of a legacy feel to it. Legacy meaning um, 1970s, 1980s era um, mechanics. But that doesn't mean it's necessarily a bad thing. It's just the impression I'm getting from my experience thus far. And then hopefully as we go through this uh, series, the, we will be able to answer that question. Does this combat uh, subsystem, does it, does it work for a game of this scale and size? Does it keep the game fun or does it maybe bog down uh, the, uh, the momentum of the game? Uh, and the last thing I want to just mention kind of briefly here is the price. These are very expensive games, and that's driven by two main factors as I see it. First, there's the amount of content in these games. The bigger games in the series have thousands of counters. They've got uh, literally 20 plus maps in them, and they're all of... Uh, they're all of high quality, good, solid quality uh, from a physical aspect. Barbarossa, for example, has 7,840 counters in it. So that's an enormous counter count by any stretch of the imagination. The more stuff you put in the box, the more expensive it is to print, and hence it's the more expensive the game itself is going to be. The second factor driving the cost on these things, I believe, is the small print runs. Being a small publisher... I just don't think Diffraction Entertainment has the resources to go out and do a 2,000 or 2,500 copy print run. And as a result, smaller print runs are going to be more expensive per unit. So all of that translates into some of the most expensive games you are going to find out on the market uh, out there today. Even the smaller games uh, like Hot Capella, uh, is you're going to probably end up spending 200 and Twenty two hundred and fifty dollars to uh, to acquire, but there is one thing unique about these games in that Diffraction Entertainment is offering various versions of each game. So you can get the what they're calling the Colonel's Edition, which is what you would expect from any other game company. Inside the box, you will find all of the maps, all of the counters, all the rules and charts printed up and ready to go. So you open the box, read through the rules, punch the counters, and go at it. They also, however, offer versions that have more or less digital components to them. So it's possible for you to buy a copy of Singapore where you get just the printed maps and printed counters inside the box and the rules and game charts are located on a CD-ROM which you would then have to download and print out yourselves. This has a lower cost than obviously the, the full version of the game and these digital versions I believe you can find a completely digital version of each of the games where everything maps counters rules charts are all located on the CD-ROM and then you would be responsible for printing out the maps and counters as well as everything else so if you are a little more DIY inclined you can end up saving substantial amounts of money on these games so if you're watching this playthrough and you say, hey, this looks like a cool system. I would really like to get my hands on these, but I just don't know if I can afford to spend three or $400 on a game. You can look at the uh, digital versions of these and get a little, uh, get a good printer and uh, just print and play yourself. And you can, uh, you can save substantial hundreds of dollars on the cost of the game. So just a little thought there. And again, it's something I think unique that I haven't seen any other publishers really do, at least to the extent that Diffraction Entertainment has done with these. So just a thought out there. Now let's get to what you guys have all been waiting for. And that is a look at these maps. All right, here's a look at uh, the maps from Singapore that I've been able to assemble and fit onto my smaller game table. What you're looking at is actually only about 40 to 50% of the total map area included in the game. And I've got it on a table that's roughly oh, a little over four and a half feet wide by a little over six feet in length here to give you some idea of just how big the total map set is for, for Singapore. I think they're pretty attractive maps. I think they look really nice from about two, two and a half feet away and, uh, and further back. I like the sort of the, 
uh, kind of neutral earth tones that they've used for the map. What we see here is uh, you've got uh, the island of Sumatra and Java here with Borneo, Southeast Asia, so French Indochina, Cambodia, Thailand, down the Kra Isthmus here, all of Malaya, and then at the very tip is the titular city for this particular game. Singapore here, you can see the island is on uh, portions of three hexes. The maps are pretty detailed and we'll give you a, kind of a look at uh, some of the terrain here as we kind of move north. There's a lot of close terrain as you would expect in this part of the, the world. This is southern Burma up here and Rangoon located. Now there is another map that would go to the north and extend the, the map layout uh, northwards. It would cover the rest of Burma all the way up to the Nepalese border. And there are actually two or three more columns of maps to the west here. Uh, they come across, they'll have the rest of the, uh, the little northern tip of Sumatra here, the Andaman and uh, Nicobar Islands, but they will come all the way across and down the east coast of India, including the island of Ceylon out here. And as we come back to the east, you can see here on Java, we've got uh, the capital Batavia here. And as we come east, we've got most of the island here, all the way over here, Surabaya, just on the map edge. However, there is another row of uh, their skinny maps, not even half size maps, but thin maps that come across and go out to the east. That will give you the rest of Java here, as well as the uh, islands out to the east, all the way over to East Timor. Borneo, you know, I think it's kind of neat. I've not seen Borneo represented in this kind of detail in, uh, in a game before. So that is one of, the, uh, one of the cool things. And these are pretty detailed maps. They include uh, not just roads, but also tracks. And uh, see if we can zoom in here. You can see this, um, where is it here? This, this dashed line here indicates a track. We've got uh, roads, railroads, both high capacity and low capacity railroads. The only quibble I might have on the maps are that they are a bit dark, which can make it hard to uh, see some of the uh, trails. Uh, let's see if I can find an example here. Yeah, here's one. You can see we've got a trail that runs north through these hexes and across here. And uh, obviously it's, it's a a little bit more difficult to see the trail and follow it in these hexes than in the lighter hexes here. But other than that, like I said, I think the uh, the maps look nice. They're well done, and uh, I'm really am looking forward to uh, um, getting some counters and uh, starting to push some cardboard on these things. So I think we will uh, wrap this intro video up there. Leave you with a, a nice look at. The, uh, the maps in Singapore here. Next up, we will start with one of the small scenarios from Singapore, probably looking at the naval combat uh, system in the game. So that's gonna do it for today. I appreciate you all watching. Take care and we'll see you next time.